John Kineski. How you doing? I'm good. How you doing? I'm great. I wish I didn't have my mic shut off 20 seconds into the last time we tried to do this. Oh, is that what happened? <laughs> yeah, I don't. So the way that this works is the uh, I'm using this program called OBS, which is open source. So it's all free software. And yeah. the every once in a while, it'll have these weird glitches that mm. and I've been doing this show for three years and I still can't like pinpoint when they'll happen. And when they do, it basically just tanks your feed and it'll just be like, eh, we're just going to disconnect your interface and this. So uh, unfortunately, sometimes oh. you have to restart it because I don't have much of a like, I can't go back and fix it later on. But we're here. Right. We were- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, good. I'll, Love a- it. I'll ask you again, where are you coming to us from? From uh, the Valley in Los Angeles. Hell yeah. You're originally from uh, Columbus, Ohio though, right? I am. Yeah. 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 What's childhood like in Columbus, Ohio? Is it, is it kind of, I don't know. I've never been to Columbus. Oh, it's just the Midwest. It's, it's farm town, right? Butted up against like the city ish. Mm -hmm. There's kind of suburban. It's, I don't know. It's the the eighties in the Midwest was my childhood. So, um, whatever that means. That's what it was. It's just really straightforward. What did your parents do? Uh, my dad, uh, is, he's a retired pilot. So he, he like flew corporate for years. Uh, and then my mom was like in childcare basically. Gotcha. And so wait, how old were you? Were you like nine when you got into guitar, right? I was. Yeah. Yeah. How'd you get in? Uh, how'd you get into guitar originally? Well, both my parents are big music lovers. And so that was kind of like, you know, like that was always in the house or whatever. And then uh, I saw like um, on like a sort of scrambled basic cable, a Guns N' Roses video. And I saw Slash playing and I was like, that's what I want to do. What song was it? I can't remember. I can't remember. But uh, whatever. It was like peak gnr and he was so cool and it was like that's the thing that'll make me kind of cool because i was a total nerd still am and it never made me cool but <laughs> it was really <laughs> but uh, it was uh i fell in love with it immediately it was like ever since i was a kid it was like you know it was never a chore to practice or anything i always loved playing so what was that back on like mtv you're trying like watching that well, that's the thing is I don't remember exactly because we didn't have cable. Like we didn't have those channels like until probably the early nineties. It was like, my parents sort of fought it. Like we don't need it. But so there was this like weird scrambled kind of semi scrambled local channel that would sometimes play videos. I think at some point in, in the day, I don't know. It wasn't MTV though. I didn't have that till later. My dad said when he was young, he remembers when uh guns and roses first came out Mm -hmm. um well it was like the first he had heard about them which was when welcome to the jungle was huge and he says Mm -hmm. he remembers like he my dad's an electrician so he used to work these like ridiculous hours where he'd work from like 5 a.m to like 1 a.m the next day you know Uh like go from one job sleep in your van go to another and he says yeah. that he had this, he remembers coming home and having like a bowl of cereal in his mother's house because he's like 20 years old and uh-huh. like Welcome to the Jungle comes on and he was like, what is this? This is ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> and I just, I'm so jealous of the fact that I, because I grew up in the, you know, not early internet age, but I grew up when YouTube was started and all that. If I wanted sure. to see anything I was going to see it. I miss have. I wish I got to grow up where you could just find out about something. Like you just go, <laughs> what? I can't believe this. Now yeah. you know about everything before you've ever seen it. And uh, I just that must yeah. be must must be like an absolutely like amazing experience. Yeah, uh, yeah. Our minds were constantly blown. Hell yeah! By every new piece of information. But yeah, no, it's it's that's a double edged sword because it was also really difficult to find like instructional material and like you know, anything like that. I took guitar lessons my whole life, whatever, growing up and playing, but, um, you couldn't just, I mean, I go on, you go on YouTube and you have like, you know, your Marty Schwartz guys and all those dudes that like, they, it's all out there, everything you want to learn, anything. It's so easy. It's mid a, a generation of incredible young guitar players. I, that was really difficult I see, in my time. I see people cause um, I've been a drummer my whole life. 
Mm. And I'm always amazed. I see kids and they're like five and they're playing stuff that I probably couldn't, yeah. I couldn't do now. It's like, what, what the hell is going on? I, well, that You're right. It's a double-edged sword because it has that side of it is absolutely yeah. incredible. It is. But yeah, there was a fun innocence. That's true. To, you know, growing up pre-internet age. And you were also, you were what, early on a big John McLaughlin fan, right? Um, uh, yeah, I discovered that, like, uh, you really did some homework. <laughs> um, I, uh, no, I discovered that I would say like maybe just out of high school. Mm. I, I didn't really know any of, any of that until, um, yeah. How do you get put yeah. onto music like that? Cause I know you, you've said that Mahavishnu is important to you, by the way, the drummer from Mahavishnu, Billy Cobham is going to be on the show soon. He was scheduled to be on oh, a couple no weeks. Way. Yeah, he's on a tour right now. He unfortunately had to reschedule a show a couple of weeks ago, but I'm I'm very excited about that. So when I saw that you were, you know, a fan yeah. of Mahavishnu. Oh, that's awesome. I think he might be an Ohio State guy. Billy Cobham? Yeah, I think so. To be honest, I did all my research for him like a month ago. And then I've had yeah, yeah, like yeah. three shows from them. So I got to go back and check yeah, all my notes. I forgot all the stuff from your book report. But that's, it's, like, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's amazing every time because I do these shows on a, a weekly basis. And I spend from when one show ends, I spend the whole next week getting ready for the next one. Uh -huh. And it's amazing. It's like for that week, I am in it. I'm in it. I'm yeah, in yeah. it. And then it's like I, I have to wipe it afterward. Otherwise, I'm going to start crossing my wires and I'm going to be bringing up yeah, stuff yeah. about people's lives that happened to someone else like a month ago. Yeah. But it's, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So wait, how yeah, that was, though. that's awesome. But yeah, I, uh, I so right out of high school, I went to this place called the Recording Workshop in Chillicothe, Ohio. It was like this tiny little recording school in the woods in uh, in Ohio. It's a pretty neat little place. And uh, there was just like some old timers there that were like, you know, wanting to kind of, they were, if you're into guitar, you need to hear this. And it was like, Mahavishnu and stuff like that. It's like blew my mind. It's like, that's so cool. So where you weren't really listening to much fusion music, you know, when you were growing up in, in Columbus? No, no, not really. I mean, you know, like I, it was like the first thing that I could remember being like into when I could actually kind of play guitar was that was when like grunge came around and I was, you know, 13 years old or something like that, 12, 13 and Nirvana was like the biggest thing. And that's what me and all my buddies loved, you know, and we were like getting into skateboarding and just being dirt bags and, um, playing, you know, that kind of stuff. So it was that. And then into high school, I started getting the classic rock. I was more on the like Zeppelin side of things. And then uh, sadly also had a little foray into new metal because it was really cool in the late 90s. Why is but... that sadly? <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that, John. <laughs> no, I know. I know when I look back on that stuff, I'm like, oh, cringe a little bit, but where are we talking like rage against the machine new well, actually, people oh people, god no no the rage against the machine's amazing they they're in a category all their yeah, own yeah i my whole life grew up saying that rage against the machine was new metal and then i yeah. learned that people don't i they are to me i know they're like they consider them like rap rock and all that i think they're like rap new metal but that's just me i got to see them recently for their uh when they came to new york city oh, oh nice. my yeah. god ridiculous insane i'm sure yeah i still haven't seen them ever um but that's that's amazing so you you were doing more of like i, I apologize but like the fred Dursty kind of side of new metal yeah, is that what I we're had, saying I, yeah i had like a new metal band in like 96 i think what were they and called it was called Switch, and then we later figured out that there was an R and B band called Switch. <laughs> and they were like, we didn't even know, like, or it wasn't their internet wasn't there. And we're like, whatever, whatever. And then uh, it was terrible, obviously. But we had like a you know a rapper guy, and then heavy a couple heavy guitar players, and that was it. Was it and original then, music or covers? It was original music, and I can't for the life of me remember what any of it was, but. Um, do you yeah, remember your like the name weird. of your closing song or anything? I don't remember any of the song titles. I wish I did. I think I just kind of moved on and put it in the past. What was the first band that you ended up starting? Was that that wasn't it, right? No. Um my first band when I was like a young teenager 
was called Titanium Brains. And it was, it was uh, but I didn't go, I was like brought into that band by some, you know, neighborhood kids or whatever. I think they're actually friends with my sisters. It's like older kids. And uh, it was just covers. And we did one gig on a parade float. <laughs> and uh, I've that, been there. I've been there. <laughs> Yeah, so that was that was the beginning of it. And then I didn't really have a serious band until probably out of high school. Okay. How old were you when that first band was started then? Uh, the Parade Fellow Band? Yes. I I mean, I had to have been maybe 11. Okay. So it was, there was a few yeah. years in between that and then really starting to kind of get into bands and taking music more yeah. seriously as a Yeah, I mean, career. that was like kids trying to like plank their way through covers terribly. Okay, but, I've been there. Also, I've also been there many, many times. <laughs> so then how old were you when you met John Spiker? So Spiker and I met out, like, out of high school. So we both graduated in 99 from different schools in Columbus. So we didn't know each other then. We didn't go to high school together. But we had a mutual friend who was like both telling each other, like, you, gotta, you should meet this guy. I think you guys will like, hit it off. So that was like probably the year after high school. When you first yeah. met, was it just like, we're good friends and we also play music or immediately it was like, we got to play music together. Like, this is why I we're friends together. I remember, yeah, it was pretty quick. Like there were a couple like hangs, but like all we did was talk about nerdy music stuff. And then we started playing. We started a band like immediately. What was the name of that band? That was just, we called it the Spiker Kineski Band because we could not come up with a band name to save our life. So... We were just like, oh, yeah, well, let's just do this. We'll just be like the, the songwriter guys who have this band. And we were like into Steely Dan at that time. And we were like, we'll be the two guys. And then, you know, we'll bring in different people. I'm like, uh, you know, whatever. And we wrote this like really complicated pop music, like overly complicated. Uh, and John has a has a great voice, like a you know, this kind of blue eyed soul sort of side to him that he, you know, used to do a lot back then. And uh so he was the singer and I just play guitar and we wrote songs together and we just got like some, you know, the best local guys we could find who wanted to play with us and just did like local shows in Ohio. So was it really just like guitar, bass, drums and was that it or was there anything else? Yeah. Oh, well, in the studio, we would put all kinds of dumb shit on it, but um, the live band was just that. Yeah. And I think we had a percussionist and we had, so we had like a drummer and a percussionist, guitar bass and then john just sang and occasionally played guitar he didn't even play bass at that point he wasn't like a bassist he could play bass but he wasn't like a bassist and i've heard you say before that i'm not sure if it was this band so correct me if i'm wrong if i'm wrong one of your bands your drummer's girlfriend was the one that actually ended up introducing you guys to kyle gas right was, was it this band that was it, mm -hmm. okay. that was it. so how yeah. did she meet him how did she meet kyle yeah 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 um so she's she likes like um i don't know it's hard to say she knows she just meets a lot of people like she goes to shows she's one of those people that really wants to meet the artists and stuff and so she kind of becomes friends with a lot of these people just by being a cool you know, she's a great hang she's super funny uh and so her and kyle kind of hit it off uh as you know friends and kept in touch uh and so yeah i think i can't remember exactly how it happened but I know that she was sort of waiting around maybe after a show to say hi or something like that. And it's kind of started from there. And then how long did she know him before you guys ended up getting introduced? That's a Spiker. good question. I mean, that might have even been like a year or two. And was that he, he was just coming through Ohio and then she's like, I know this guy is coming to Ohio. You guys should talk to him. When that happened, it, Kyle was starting train wreck with JR mm -hmm. here in California. And he, Kyle had this idea that maybe they would go, him and JR would go to a place and like hire local guys to be the band. And it was kind of this old school sort of paradigm where, you know, guys used to do that. And it's like, you know, watch me for the changes kind of thing or whatever. But it ended up being that he wanted to go to Ohio and kind of tour around Midwest a little bit and asked Aaron if she knew anybody. And it was us. She was like, yeah. And so was there so then, even, was there like any type of audition process or is just, you guys play the instruments I need. You're good. You're in the band now. That, yes. And I originally was not playing guitar. I was just going to be teching. 
And Spiker was not playing bass. He was just going to be helping out. So how did that morph into actually so, joining? Yeah. So when they came in and they did a rehearsal in this dude's, this friend of Aaron's basement, the drummer was John and I's drummer. The bass player was John and I's bass player. And then I started kind of like, we were there, Spiker and I were there. And I was like playing this like chord melody guitar thing and Kyle always loved, loved that kind of stuff, like Ted Green chord melody. So we started talking about that stuff. And then he's just like, you want to play guitar? And I was like, yeah. And it was just, that's how that started. And then I was in Trainwreck. Uh, and then Spiker was doing like backup vocal stuff. Like just, he was just kind of, yeah, they're hanging out and doing that kind of stuff. And uh, I can't remember exactly when the switch happened, but it wasn't very long before he was playing bass, basically. So I think the yeah. Did you come up with the the character of JB Shredman? No, uh that was uh I thought it was probably JR. Okay. Um I think JR, yeah, it was, it was J, JR and Kyle. They kind of came up with all of the the characters and names at that point. So this is around what, like 2002, 2003? Yeah, it'd be probably 02. Because then John and I moved in 03. And that's, that's when you moved to LA? Yeah. Okay, so what was that, what was the catalyst that made you say, after you know you toured a train wreck in Ohio, we're going to LA now, we gotta you know, really start taking this seriously? Yeah, basically, that was a big part of it, but we had already had that plan. John and I wanted to, like, we were, we were total, like, I mean, I don't wanna say deadbeats, but like, all we wanted to do was play music, and we didn't wanna, work like jobs that weren't music related and we didn't you know we wanted to be where it was happening we didn't have any money we didn't have anything we were just like we were gonna go regardless we had already had that plan so the kyle meeting was like that was like okay well now we actually have somebody that we can you know look up when we get there and then it was just you got to la did he have a band like, uh, cause you guys were the Ohio guys. Did he have his LA guys when you got there? Not really. There were some guys like here and there, but, um, like, I think, I think Steve McDonald, the bass player who played on the first D record, I think he did like an early train wreck gig or two. Um, and I can't remember if there's anybody else. Um, but Kevin Wiseman, the drummer who was the, the, uh, the actor in Alias at that time, and he was a friend of Jaron Kyle's. He was the drummer from, I guess, the beginning. Uh, and so, anyway, um, yeah, there wasn't an LA band for us to come in and like take the place of. It didn't, it was just, it was open, you know. Were you working any other gigs before you ended up fully joining Trainwreck? No, I mean, we came to LA and we were like, should we call Kyle? Should we call Kyle. And then like we gave him a call and he was like, Hey, you guys come out. We're going all we're all going to do karaoke at this place called the Brass Monkey in West Hollywood or whatever. And we just all like went out, got drunk, and did karaoke with Kyle. And then like a couple days later, it was like, You guys want to go on tour? And then like we started doing stuff. So it was like I still, to this day, it was like some of the most fun touring I've ever done. Cause it wasn't like, it wasn't real touring in the sense that like, there wasn't management, like there wasn't like a, there wasn't infrastructure and a team or anything like that. It was very ragtag, but it was Kyle. So it was like, there's people, you know, coming to the shows and it was really fun and it was rowdy and it was like bar gigs and we were touring around in an RV it was it was super fun and we were so young and had no idea what we were doing except we were just there to have fun did you guys always like for all these tours did you always bring those two women that were on the sides of the stages that were always dancing with you or is that no, i saw that on kimmel no, i was like do you always have them with you yeah that was a one-off i think they might have done one gig uh but yeah that was a that was a special thing for kimmel i was gonna say that's <laughs> That's that's two extra mouths you got to feed on tour. Like that's dedication. Yeah. That's dedication no, to no. the to the to the the lore <laughs> of training. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we weren't that dedicated to it. <laughs> so then it's what two or three years from when you moved to LA, you joined Trainwreck, um, and then you end up working on the studio album for Pick a Destiny and end up doing the Pick a Destiny tour. How long 
after joining Trainwreck, did that conversation about you possibly joining Tenacious D for that next album? How long was it before that? Yeah, that first conversation was just, do you guys want to play on the record? And that was, I mean, that probably would have been in 05 and John and I landed in 03. So it was short, you know, shy of two years or so of, um, you know, we had no expectation of that. We had no, like, we, John and I never, like, gunned for it or, like, anything like that. We we always knew that there might be some possibility that we would do bigger things based on the fact that we were getting out and touring and playing and we were meeting people and, and everything. But, um, yeah, it was probably within that two years we started hearing things about pick a destiny you know i i think maybe i kyle gave me a script or something too to like read and you know uh, that kind of thing was happening it's like oh this is really exciting like this is cool again no expectations of anything from it uh but then uh, and i don't even remember when or how but yeah they just asked us do you guys want to play on the record and we were like Yes, definitely. <laughs> How well did you know, like the HBO show and their first album before they asked you to join? Uh, to me, the HBO show was like this special thing that like, I felt like it was made for me. Like I was, you know, a teenager in my parents' bedroom on this little like 13 inch tiny TV and HBO would come on. I'd be staying up too late on a school night and it would be the HBO episodes. And it was the most amazing, hilarious thing I'd ever seen in my life. And I go to school the next day to like ask if my friends saw it and nobody knew what I was talking about. And I was like, crazy. It's like, no, there's like these two guys and they're like, it's hard to explain, but it's so funny. So like that was very special to me. Like there only ended then, up being what, like three episodes, I think. I think made, there right? six. I, I think there might have been six. Oh, OK. Um, and then the, the their first record came out. It was. I remember because Kyle was later told me that 9-11 actually like held up. It was a weird sort of, it was around that time when everything obviously horrible. And like, so that came out in like uh, 2001, 2000, something like that. Uh, but uh, yeah, all that stuff was instrumental to me. Like, like this is the most amazing, like I love comedy and rock and roll, but done in a, in this special new way that I'd never seen really, you know? So when you joined, you already, you, you, you knew the vibe, you understand everything. There was no transition. It was just, I, Oh, I get it. I know this. I know the source. I know the lore. <laughs> I, know, I know where to go from here. Uh, uh, yeah. I was well versed in, in their thing for sure. So then after that three month tour for pick a destiny, was it just um, immediately like, you guys are now your members of, of, of the D no, no, not. I mean, you know, it's sort of never been that and it's, and that's fine. It's like, we, we love it when it comes around, we love doing it. Um, you know, I, I remember at that point in time, that tour was amazing and it was huge. Uh, cause it was like, it was like a movie promo tour or something. Um, so I had never done anything of that size. Um, and I, you know, that was a difficult thing where I was like, oh, I guess this is my life now. But like, you know, like I was so green and like didn't know. And then it was done. And then that was it. And it was like, oh, I guess what am I, you know, like, <laughs> like it took me a minute to kind of figure out like, oh, yeah, this even though this amazing thing is happening. It's not always going to be happening. So what did you do for work right after that tour ended? I don't honestly remember. I mean, I've always taught off and on. Um, I would, at that point, I was starting to like get gigs doing, you know, random things like sessions here and there. Um, but uh, I, I don't remember a lot. I mean, I think I was really into like, you know, I was, I tried to start bands around then and I always just wanted to be creative more than I wanted to be like a session guy or whatever. 
did it ever cross your mind at that time you know now that you know you're doing all this freelance stuff was it was it just kind of like okay i got it i got a good flow going whether i'm teaching or i'm doing gigs here and there i'm good the move was a good decision were there ever times where you're like shit like i'm str- i don't know what's i don't know where my my next meal is going to come from was there ever that period of time i've never felt comfortable <laughs> in my entire life in this industry um you know it's always a question of what's next. I, you know. I remember I had a conversation with Sean Pelton, who's the drummer for Saturday Night Live. Oh, okay. And yeah. he was telling me about when he was orig- like first kind of working in the city. This was before he got his audition for SNL. Mm-hmm. Every gig was just like he would come home. And I, I think what he said, I think it was a, I think he said a can of tuna. I think is what I remember him saying. It was like a can of tuna and ketchup or something. And he goes, and that was what I had for years. He's like, I would do a gig and I would just be like, well, back to my tuna. I guess that's what I'm eating for the next thing until he got SNL and got that work. So like, it's, it's funny. You have to be a certain level for this, any type of entertainment industry. You kind of have to be a little bit crazy because you just have to love it. You have to love it so much that no matter what's going on, you're going to keep going. Yeah, or you have to really badly not want to do anything else. That's where I am. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing or what? <laughs> I do this because I uh, I started this during the pandemic because I couldn't do any gigs. I had just was about to gradu- graduate from music school in the city. And uh-huh. then I ended up getting a job in television, um, oh, nice. working for CBS Television Studios. And man, like you go in and you're like, oh, this is TV. This is This is it. And then it boils down that comes down and you go this is an office job and i'm not dissing office jobs i had never had one but then i once that ended i was like i can't like and it was good for me because i learned it i experienced it no i can't say oh i just i don't want to do it because i never did i know it that i I don't want to do it and man it's it's tough so i'm doing this and uh, i dj on the side to pay my bills and i'm just going until until i'm eating tuna and ketchup like sean pelton (laughs) yeah no it's uh there's existential crises often in in this universe and i've talked to friends of mine who do a lot more than me and still have that feeling and they're still sort of like i never know what's next you know it's good all isn't that fun that no matter what level you're on you're always going to be miserable about something (laughs) i know i know it's uh it's crazy so then how long was that period um after the tour doing all this stuff, this freelance stuff where you get called again and you start, cause you guys didn't do a full proper tour till rise of the Phoenix for 2012, but you're doing one-off shows and shorter runs with like Queens of the stone age. And, uh, I believe beastie boys and then foo fighters. when did you get called in for that kind of stuff? How long was that period? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't remember beastie boys, foo fighters. We did a foo fighters tour in Australia, but that was later. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, there, there was a big dead zone. And yet it was maybe one offs here and there, like occasional festival. Maybe there was a lot of train wreck in there too. Like when pick a destiny touring fell off, I think that's when we really like, we tried to have a go at train wreck. Like, so I think that's really where a lot of my time and energy went now that I'm thinking about it. Uh, Cause we put that, we put the reckoning out and then did a bunch of touring on that in the U S uh, and then that did kind of give way into like, yeah, occasional other gigs, but also then Rise of the Phoenix started. Um, you'd probably know better than I what year. I, that, uh, I believe 2012, but that's according to one website that just had a list of, it was like Tenacious D tour history, and I just took it as gospel, so it could be lying to me too. Okay. And I don't remember what year the record came out, but um, sorry, I'm just going <laughs> to... Um, yeah, cause, uh, where is it? it came out in 2012. Okay. So that means we would have been working on it for a number of years leading up to it. Really that uh, long. Cause it wasn't pick a desk. Yeah, it was only a few likely. months of recording, right? Well, that was an anomaly. Um, there were like nuggets of stuff. I think that Jack and Kyle had, but I do remember there was deadlines because there were movie deadlines and it was like, you know, it, it became a thing. We got to get this. We got to get this. We got this. Uh, that's where things like the metal 
came from that sort of urgency where Kyle and I were together kind of working on some guitar stuff and that became the metal and, and stuff like that. It was just like, it, it had it just, it, the urgency of it uh, caused different sort of, I guess, writing arrangements or whatever. Um, and then Rise of the Phoenix, I think was more of an actual D album cycle where it's Jack and Kyle working through ideas for a long, you know, for a long time until things are right. Uh, and then also, I you know uh, John Kimbrough wrote some stuff on that as well, but um, yeah, I know that took a long time. And that song Death Star, that was actually recorded with John King prior to st when they started working with John Kimbrough. So that was years prior. Back with the metal when you were working with Kyle, who originally came up with the the main riff for that song? You or Kyle? Um, it was it was a kind of like sort of awesome symbiosis. Um, the idea was to write a song that would be Master Exploder because Master Exploder didn't exist yet. Oh, okay. Um, and so I had a guitar, and I started kind of playing some was like, boom, 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 whatever. And Kyle was sort of sculpting it, you know, like telling me what to do sort of here and there and like changing it. Uh, and that's how the main riff sort of came about. Um, and then there was the, the vanquished foes finger style thing was like an old finger style exercise I used to do in my teenage years. And then uh, the, the end part of it is all just like improvised guitar stuff that then got ended up getting kind of pieced together into that whole end section when you write this so, stuff do you ever go like i think i asked the same question to randy brecker in regards to some skunk funk but do you ever write it and go this is great we're in the studio this is awesome and then you go i gotta fucking play this on stage every single night <laughs> like does that does that ever come into the picture at all uh not really um i'm trying to think if there's anything that's like that complicated one thing that we do is a, there's a lot of like bits that are sort of harmonized guitars. Um, so that stuff is obviously like you have to get kind of creative with. I've been using a harmonizer pedal for some of that stuff. But I mean, even Master Exploder, like we only just started playing that live. We never used to. Uh, and it's it's like really fun. Like I kind of you kind of build your own sort of live version of it that has enough of the elements to kind of sell it. Um, but there's nothing that I'm like, oh no, how am I going to do this? Uh, anything like that. Does, does the comedic shtick of the D ever get tiring because you're always, you kind of always have to have this extra layer of performance on your music. Now, obviously, you know, besides being dressed as antichrist and all that, you're not, you don't have to be like acting the whole time, but there is always that kind of extra layer of character that you put to these things. Does that ever get tiring because you have to do that? Or is it kind of, is it a way to kind of keep it fresh having been in the band for, for what, around 17 years? Um, yeah, I don't really, there's not, not really any expectation about that so much. I mean, the show is Jack and Kyle. Um, me and John and Scott, our job is to support that and make it the the best version of it it can be in the context of a live band. Um, so in terms of like acting and things like that, only if it's asked of us, do we ever do that? Mm -hmm. um, and it's more fun than anything else because you have like two of the funniest guys up front who are very much carrying this show from a comedic sense. So, you know, we're, it's just, we're along for the ride more than anything. And it's a blast, you know. Do you guys like to keep that going in between shows, kind of have that fun energy or is that kind of all put into the stage? And if let's say you are, because I know you sing Beale's a boss, stuff like that. If you are doing these characters, does that kind of stop once the show ends? You go back, you recoup, and then you're back on when you do the next show. I mean, we like to have a good time in terms of like, we're kind of always joking around and Jack and Kyle are as hilarious, if not more so on the bus as they are on stage. So that's all great. But I don't know if there's any kind of I like doing Beelzebos and stuff like that. It, it's not like it's um, some intensive method acting situation. It's just 
it's just a fun thing to do. I don't have to come down from it or anything like that. Well, you do have I, to I be possessed. You, mean. you have to be possessed by the devil <laughs> on a consistent basis. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's just that, you know. Now, jump in the train wreck. I wanted to ask because it has been said that because Trainwreck had that that breakup from 2010 till I think about 2018 and mm-hmm. it's been said that the catalyst for that was a um, quote a mad shitty gig in Chicago where the band imploded into irreparable damage and I just want to know <laughs> what happened at that gig yeah it's you know it's not something that like it's not much of a story to be honest it's not like it's, it was more of a sort of sad event that, you know, started with a disagreement that blew up that sort of, it had, I think what really happened is people will, you know, like any kind of counselor will tell you that it's rarely the thing that you're fighting about is the actual problem. So the, that band, the problem really had been this sort of like, bubbling up of real of the realization that people weren't coming and people weren't liking it. So we had like a an early phase where it was really exciting, um, where we were drawing well. And there was um, we had we did like this two night thing at this. Um, I can't remember the name of the club in New York, but um, maybe it was like two shows in a night or two nights. And like HBO was there like they were like people were working on like a train wreck show and there, you know, there was talk of this sort of recreating, I think the sort of, uh, weird sort of alt comedic show that the D was and sort of doing a train wreck version of it. I'm kind of getting off base here, but like there was a time where that was happening and things were exciting and people were coming to our shows. And then there was a time where it kind of stopped. And there was a lot of shows where we would show up and there wouldn't just not be anybody there. Like we wouldn't sell any tickets. It'd be like, you know, pre-sold 10, you know, like, like, you know, play for like, play for the opening band. And it's guys on tour who were putting a lot of energy and effort into this. And you don't want it to die and you don't want it to fail. So it's hard to like admit that it is. Uh, and at that phase of train wreck, that was what was happening is we were sort of going through this downfall together. So it was becoming more tense because we just weren't happy with the, the result of our efforts. Um, and then you put everything out there on stage every night and it's a quarter house or, you know, or 30 people or 20 people and, you know. That's that's basically what happened, you know. <laughs> how long after how long after that initial breakup? Because um, it would end up taking like eight years before you'd re, you'd regroup. How long into that were you like, I'm I'm really missing this. I'm missing with working with this band specifically. That's not really. That's it's a touchy subject. Okay, I'll, you don't, you don't I, have to. It's, you know, it's what what happened was there were some hatchets buried in a very beautiful way that like some of us started speaking again uh and it was time to put that stuff behind us um it was very easy to sort of move on from train wreck when it fell apart because um tenacious d was actually getting really busy and we were making rise of the phoenix we were touring on that going to Europe for the first time with Tenacious D. They're like, you know, for the longest time, they were sort of hesitant to go because they weren't sure if uh, comedy would translate, things like that. Um, and we went um, and it was amazing. So it started this whole new era of Tenacious D where it's become this sort of international touring act. And it was, and still is, you know, I mean, it's it's the most fun and the most, satisfying soul satisfying thing i've ever been involved in in my life mm-hmm. it's the best people um so that was happening then so like yeah i was like okay we got to put train wreck in the past we have to put some of that i guess you know i don't want to say trauma but just put it behind us move on you know at a certain point like i said became time to like you know we need to move on from this 
stinky little thing in our past and make it good again. Well, John, I, we... I appreciate you being so honest about this. I, I, I don't, I'm not trying to get you in trouble. <laughs> No, no, it's all good. I honestly, I don't know that there's anybody out there who will actually even give a shit about, about this story. Well, <laughs> actually, I, uh, I segues me really well, actually. I went online and I went to Reddit and I said that you were coming on the show and I asked if any mm -hmm. people on Reddit had some questions. If you don't mind, I'll ask you some because a few of them are actually, I'd say a good amount of them were were about train wreck. Specifically, uh, oh, okay. someone wanted to know, this, per this comes from Dreaming the Live 90s. Uh, they said, what's the inspiration for the song Tim Blankenship? Um, so I think Kyle wrote Tim Blankenship and you'd have to ask him. Um, I didn't fact check uh, these. So if these people didn't, if these people didn't do their research, no, I, I do mean, mine. But if there's a wrong, just say it. So you could just be like, fuck you. No, it's, it, I mean, I don't think that information is even really out there. It's like it's a song by train wreck or whatever but yeah that's a that's a kyle song and i i think it's it's just sort of a, a i think the joke is that it's this sort of ridiculous machismo sort of character that he was kind of playing you know playing around with um and i think that's that's the you know that's pretty much it i think yeah just a fun character to write about <laughs> I would think. <laughs> I gotcha. Okay, the next one comes from The Five Needs, who asks, are more Guitarings episodes coming? I was actually going to ask the, you that originally, but then they did, and I didn't want them to think I was ripping them off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Um, Kyle and I, we talk about it a lot. We get a lot of people uh, coming up to us after shows and stuff, uh, asking about it. Um, and we keep trying, but like, we just don't have like the we had a great like production team that was like the, that produced the bulk of the guitarings episodes. Uh, and we just didn't, we didn't grow big enough, fast enough. And we part ended up having to part ways. So, um, we don't really have people to do it. So that's been the hard part is like, I've, a couple of times I've tried to like, okay, like I'll get the camera set up and do some like shitty editing, but I just don't know if it'd be as good. I mean, yes, of course, obviously having a crew is going to make something look better. But I think, you know, if the core content is there, that's why I have all these flashy. I have like lights and cam my nice camera. It's to cover up the lack of substance. But since you guys have the substance, just set up the cameras. I think people will be pretty happy. Uh, we'll see. We've tried a couple times, but, you know, life gets in the way a little bit. But um, um, we would like to. That, I mean, definitely Kyle and I would like to. Gotcha. Okay, this last one comes from Call Me Mitch, who asks, uh, is Trainwreck going to do another EU tour since the last got canceled for COVID? Yeah, that was a bummer. Uh, we were really excited to take Trainwreck to Europe um, for the first time. But I don't, as of now, I don't think so. Um, I don't really know what's going on with it, to be honest. Um, we have, like, the better part of a record done. But there aren't really any plans with it. So by extension, there are no touring plans either. We did do a short run in the uh, West Coast like a year ago or something like that, a year and a half ago. And once again, we were sort of in this thing where we're like, nobody's coming. Like, it's just like, it was like bad turnout and stuff. And, you know, I think that's a bit of a, you know, kind of a letdown. So it might've knocked the wind out of our sails slightly. Mm -hmm. I think if I had to, guess what happened but it's a fun record i hope it comes out i'm excited to hear it okay i got one <laughs> one more from reddit which is did you ever see the d getting big enough to headline a show uh, as big as the o2 one in london the other day um no that's a good question i mean we certainly i mean i've played big shows with them but that's that's a big show i hate when people on the internet be ask better questions than i do <laughs> because i was i saw that one i was like that is a good question and i was like shit i wish i thought of that yeah i i don't know i mean look i i don't know why everybody in the world doesn't love the d it should be a you know a, a stadium band by by my estimation but uh you know i think there's no it's the biggest headlining show that uh i, I believe I think there's one marketing problem with Tenacious D, just on my opinion. It is listed as the greatest band in the world, or the greatest band on earth. That's too small. 
I think it needs to be oh, yeah, the yeah. greatest band in the foreseeable oh. universe. <laughs> I think that will, there you go. There's your marketing slant. There's your oh, Apple uh, think different or Nike do it or whatever right. Nike's is. There you go. I will pass that along <laughs> to the powers that be. <laughs> well, John, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Do you have anything you want to promote? Anything you want to say to the audience before I let you go? Oh, well, one thing we didn't touch on was Winchester, which is my uh, my band with Mike uh, Bray. We have a new record that uh, is coming out at some point this year. And uh, yeah, that's been a really, really like creatively satisfying pursuit for me. So that's one band that like whoever's watching, please go look up Winchester, W-Y-N-C-H-E-S-T-E-R and uh, check it out. Give us a follow or whatever because um, we want more people to like us. <laughs> Hell yeah, John. Thank you so much for joining me. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, sure thing. Dope, dope, dope. Would you mind sticking around for one second after I say goodbye? Yep. Cool. Everyone, thank you. We'll be live next week. Not sure the time yet, but it will be with the first person who's ever on the show and one of my absolute best friends, Mr. Augie Bello. So I will see all you guys, if I queue up this right video, uh, next week. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.